Not too long ago, there was a bit of a stir surrounding the 2017 reboot of the Magic School Bus, and it got me wondering whether there was any validity to the criticism surrounding the new show. If you were anything like me as a kid in elementary school, you probably weren't too receptive to overtly educational programming. I wasn't a terrible student or anything, but I was one of those Cheeto-fingered Power Rangers obsessed kids who ran at the sight of anything that was for my own good. Learning? Let's get out of here! Hey! But even though the Magic School Bus was transparently educational, the wacky and colorful narratives made each episode feel more like an adventure story instead of an extra after school lecture. With the reboot of the show receiving recent attention, I want to take a look back at the original and how it managed to teach us without being boring or heavy handed, as well as examine if the reboot maintains the original's effectiveness and spirit. So in this video, let's take a look back at how the Magic School Bus helps foster an interest in science for generations of kids and see if the new version can carry on its legacy. The Magic School Bus was an educational children's show that aired from 1994 to 1997, following the magical escapades of an elementary school class as they learned about the new science topic each episode. So was it just me? Is it just me? Or did this show teach us more than school actually did? Probably not. But it seems the way the show taught topics may have left longer lasting impressions of the lessons it was trying to impart. I still remember how I learned Pluto is incompatible with life, as I watched Arnold definitely freeze to death just so he could shut up his annoying cousin. You couldn't convince seven-year-old me that he didn't cease to exist in that moment. I remember learning how honeybees communicate with each other via the waggle dance, and the mysterious ways light allows us to perceive color. I even remember specific corrections made in the fact check segment at the end of the show. And don't think I didn't notice that you had all the planets lined up in a neat little row? <laughs> oh, that. Well, it's true that planets are very rarely all lined up like that. Yeah, like almost never. Of course. I'm not saying a TV show could possibly replace actual school, but there was something particularly effective about these educational tools that textbooks and schoolroom lessons couldn't always achieve, especially when aimed towards young children. So what exactly made these lessons so memorable? First off, visuals and animation obviously play a major role in keeping kids' attention, which I'll get into later. But I also think the classroom setting played a huge part, as it featured kids that reminded us of our peers, or even extensions of our own curious minds. From the class clown to the teacher's pet, and even that one kid who wouldn't shut up about her old school. At my old school, we were never allowed to be digested. The class's diverse characteristics and personalities created a relatable and engaging dynamic where everyone was free to think out loud and crack dumb jokes. <laughs> Get it? President Carlos! <laughs> The narrative structure of the episodes is also a surprisingly significant aspect, starting with a banger of a theme song. Each episode tells a compelling story with a science-centered plot and dozens of relevant facts thrown in along the way. Think of the episode on digestion, where the lesson becomes a wild journey through Arnold's gut. What's that? Girl, that's a booty hole. Not a hole, Keisha. A valve. Or the episode with the not at all disgusting depiction of salmon migration patterns. Narratives are known to aid memory retention, so they're often used as mnemonic devices. The stranger the story, the more likely you are to remember it. The Magic School Bus is no different. In fact, this engaging narrative structure was inherited. The show was adapted from a popular book series of the same name which began publishing in the mid-80s. The series featured a larger class size that's truer to real life, and the storylines became the basis for many of the show's initial episodes. And at the center of the story, of course, was Miss Frizzle and her shape-shifting school bus. Author Joanna Cole's characterization of Miss Frizzle is that of a teacher we all wish we had. Intelligent, somewhat kooky, and enthusiastic about education. Miss Frizzle is, first and foremost, an enthusiast. She likes her students, she admires her students, but what she likes is the subject she's teaching. Most. That's what she loves. So she carries the class along on her enthusiasm. Miss Frizzle's quirky and energetic personality created a space of excitement and spontaneity that ignited curiosity in the minds of her young students. It's time to explore the unknown. Be adventurous, brave, and bold. Let's go. Miss Frizzle isn't beloved just for her eccentric fashion sense or because she always has the right answers. 
even though she does. It's because she fosters an environment where her students can uncover an experimental awareness about the world around them without fear of judgment or adult indifference. With her guidance, they're empowered to explore and make connections on their own. Excellent observation, Ravi. Bullfrogs need quiet water to lay their eggs in. As a teacher myself, for me, the most satisfying part of the job is seeing the wheels turning in my students' minds and seeing them try to figure out some of the mysteries of the world on their own. I would be remiss to imply The Magic School Bus was the only educational show that had a great impact on me. Shows like Zaboomafu helped develop a curiosity and appreciation for nature, while Reading Rainbow instilled a long-lasting love for literature. And I can't forget Bill Nye the Science Guy, whose impact is still felt today as he continues to encourage science education. Science these shows profoundly influenced our generation's curiosity about the inner workings of the world, something that can't always be accomplished with a textbook, especially when it comes to stubborn kids like I was. Nothing illustrates this phenomenon more than the episode Plays Ball, where Dorothy Ann brings a physics book to school and her classmates are less than thrilled. Force is just a push or a pull. If you're gonna force us to listen to this... You're being kinda pushy, don't you think? In classic Magic School Bus fashion, the class shrinks into the book and needs to find a way to escape as they traverse its contents. What'll happen to us if we can't get out? Guess we'll be food for the bookworms. <laughs> Carlos! While the book contains the same information they later find fascinating, it isn't until the class is entangled in another wacky adventure that they come to appreciate what the book has to offer. Though experiences like this can't be replicated in our classrooms, would be cool though. The Magic School Bus shows that students often need varying and hands-on experiences to spark fascination with the subject matter. This brings us to the 2017 reboot, The Magic School Bus Rides Again. It's what you'd call a soft reboot, basically a continuation of the previous show with some updates instead of a brand new show on its own. Thank goodness! I was afraid of what I might find when I got here. Something could have changed over the summer. There's been lots of criticism from longtime fans about the new show. One of the main issues stem from the character design. I'll admit it's less than inspired. Their faces look the same and the children of color are generally whitewashed with their ethnic features greatly reduced. Comparing the new kids design with the old ones, it's easy to see how many of the unique physical characteristics of the original kids were lost. A lot of the flavor that made the original so fresh is missing, and the style feels corporate and bland. While a Studio 9 Story Media Group has produced several successful shows, in my opinion, the style the animators chose strips away much of the visual charm of the original animation, almost like it's for toddlers rather than elementary school kids learning about science and tech. Visually speaking, it seems like a somewhat hollow depiction of the lively class we remember. But the most polarizing difference in the show is probably the new Miss Frizzle. While many have criticized the show for beautifying Miss Frizzle, making her clothes less eccentric, and erasing some of the original Frizz's Jewish features, these are surface level observations about physical traits that aren't indicative of the character's personality. I say this because, though the popular discourse seems to be pretty hostile towards the reboot, it's apparent that most of the people giving their two cents haven't watched it. A lot of them seem to think the new Frizzle was simply a redesign of the old character, but that isn't the case. And DA, according to your research, you must realize, it's, it's a, a whole, whole different, different frizzle. frizzle! She's actually the original Frizz's sister, Fiona, voiced by Kate McKinnon. This misunderstanding is reflective of our knee-jerk reaction to reject anything that attempts to revamp a cherished childhood movie or TV show. The sentiment is understandable, as most attempts to do this yield lame results. But I think to give the reboot a fair chance, we have to consider its content. So I went ahead and watched the Magic School Bus rides again to see if it held up. And I was surprised to see the first episode preemptively address the concerns of longtime fans. Everything's exactly like it was when we left last year. Come on, Jyoti. Welcome to your first day. I'll show you around. It starts off with the class coming back to their room for a new year of school, noting all the consistencies they've grown accustomed to in their years with Miss Frizzle. Miss Frizzle always gets here at exactly the same time and puts her mug that we made for her in the exact same spot on her desk. But the kids are soon introduced to their new teacher, Fiona. In a fairly overt metaphor, throughout the episode, the class learns about invasive species and their effect on the environments they invade. Yes! 
to the guests from DA. If things that already live here have no defense, the new species can take over and change everything! And change everything. Arnold, displeased about the new Frizzle, thinks of her as an invasive species to the ecosystem of the class. Arnold appears to speak for the audience of people who are frustrated that the reboot happened in the first place. You need to come back! What's the problem? Your sister is nice and everything, but she's new! Yes? And new things are always trouble. The original Frizz, still voiced by Lily Tomlin, pops up here and there to reassure Arnold about the change. She also appears at the end of the episodes for the correction portions, but for the most part, she's off on her own adventures doing scientific research as a professor with her new animal sidekick. What we learn from the episode, other than the impact of invasive species, is that change isn't always bad. Just as with the environment, introducing new elements isn't always detrimental. Sometimes they simply create something different and new that can still thrive harmoniously. When I got past my initial displeasure with the show's changes, I actually enjoyed it. It's pretty funny, and even with the lackluster character design, the way the animation depicts scientific concepts is pretty good. Plus, the new series does an excellent job explaining these new concepts in a simple way. Tortoises eat the leaves, ticks bite the tortoises, and finches eat the ticks. In that sense, I think it does a great job of encapsulating the original tone and spirit of its predecessor. Because the whole point of the show is for kids to learn, and I think its ability to achieve that is the most relevant way to judge its quality. A great example of this is in the episode The Battle for Rock Mountain. Tim draws a comic about an epic superhero battle between Captain Rockman and Weatherman. He gradually adds more characters to the story that showcase the multitude of transformations that rocks undergo through thousands of years of erosion. It's reminiscent of an episode from the original series about erosion. In the 90s incarnation, the class is tasked with creating a statue of their city's founder, following the instructions left from a poem of his. It sure would be a lot easier if we could use our hands to carve it. Despite their initial confusion, the kids soon realize he wanted it sculpted through erosion as they witness their statue's physical form change as it slides down a mountain. The old and new lessons are both visually effective in showcasing the changes made by erosion. The original series introduces the topic and shows the gradual changes made to rocks and the process in which water breaks it down. All the sand and gravel rubbed us smooth and made our suit smaller. Meanwhile, the new series expands on it by showing the entire cycle in which rock is transformed and shaped through weather and heat, highlighting the cyclical nature of how rocks develop, break down, and change. They both present the topic at hand in a manner that's interesting to kids in a way they can understand and remember, using bizarre and magical narratives to help them remember complex concepts. Most of the episodes in the reboot detail new themes and topics though, with an increased focus in engineering and technology. That's another notable difference in the new series. It expands on the original by highlighting more of the TEM and STEM. So while a majority of the episodes in the original series involve subjects like biology, geology, and astronomy, the new series brought in more episodes featuring engineering, real life math applications, and technology. They also bring in a new character, Gioti, to replace Phoebe. Here, you can have Phoebe's old seat. She went back to her old school. In my opinion, it was a good choice to replace Phoebe, as she didn't add much substance to the dialogue. At my old school, we weren't allowed to get eroded. Gioti is essentially the tech geek, meant to help usher in new themes of technology in a now digital era. It's a necessary update to the original as the sole episode dedicated to technology was this one about computers. To take a risk, make like a floppy disk. And revisiting the character of Fiona, the quality both Frizzle share is the eagerness to explore. While her design isn't particularly special or interesting, she still has a fun personality that keeps you engaged, with humor that's further emphasized by Kate McKinnon's voice acting. I haven't lost a kid yet! This year, uh, kidding, or am I? You'll never know. As opposed to Valerie's wizard-like wisdom, Fiona comes off more like she's flying by the seat of her pants, creating a degree of unpredictability, as though she's also exploring along with the kids. Her energy still speaks to the frizzle mantra of taking chances, making mistakes, and getting messy. I still have to figure out how to spin that rotor. Arnold, just gotta go with it, bud, okay? Something that's gonna turn up. From what I've seen, most of the criticism of the new show seems to come from older, nostalgic fans of the original. Either parents watching with their kids, or people seeing screenshots online. I can understand older fans feeling left out or betrayed by this new series, but the show isn't just meant for entertainment. We can still enjoy the humor, animation, and even learn a thing or two from the show. 
and it's nice that they addressed our concerns about change in the first episode. But often, when you're examining a piece of media, one of the most important questions you have to consider is, who is this for? Acknowledging the target audience is especially relevant when discussing children's media. The Magic School Bus is, first and foremost, an educational tool. The focus of the show is the learning experience of a young audience. From the reviews I've read, most of the negative ones typically go on about how much of a disservice it is to the original and how it's ruined their childhood. I read a lengthy review on IMDb where the reviewer goes on into great detail about things like continuity errors and weak storylines. Most notably to me, it starts with the sentence, I had high expectations for this reinvention of one of my most beloved childhood edutainment series, and unfortunately, they weren't able to meet them. As though this fully grown adult's narrative expectations for a kid's educational show should have been taken into account. They didn't even mention having kids. So y'all watching Magic School Bus on your own? For educational purposes? Go watch a David Attenborough documentary and call it a day. The reviewers who do have children cited their child enjoyment of the series and its effectiveness in engaging them with STEM topics. Like Johnny H, age 5, who's seen the old and new versions and likes both of them. I think too many people are starting to sound a lot like Phoebe, lamenting over what used to be for very little reason. It's at my old school. When I was in Mr. Seedplot's class. But Phoebe, this is your new school. Even with the barrage of negative reviews and Twitter mob dunking on it, I think the rebooted series is a pretty faithful adaptation, with a few new bells and whistles for a new generation of kids to enjoy. It makes a commendable effort to relate to the real world by addressing current issues like renewable energy and climate change, teaching kids about these subjects while also encouraging them to actively participate in taking care of their planet. All of this is to say, I think people should give the reboot a chance to cement its legacy for a new audience. Like this review from As It Blue, 90s kid, 2019 mom, love the show. Why? Because my kid loves it. He's entertained by it, he's learning, and I couldn't ask for anything better. I love the original one, but that was my time. Let these little ones have their shows. Can't see how a show that's meant to educate can be bad. At the end of the day, if this new magic school bus can inspire the next generation to be more scientifically literate and eager to find the next great discovery, then it's still accomplishing what Joanna Cole set out to do over 30 years ago. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you guys enjoyed. I wanted to know, do you guys think the new versions of classic shows should think more about nostalgic fans, or should it just be about the kids today watching? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.